Hey, we're live. Uh, we are, well, kind of. There's always this little moment where it's loading that I have to then mute it. Hey, we're live. Nope. Now I have to mute it. All right. Okay. So, uh, first and foremost, I'm being joined by my good friend and collaborator, Nick Norwitz. How are you doing, Nick? Very good. Um, begin. Naturally, we two disclaimers. One, uh, we're going to be talking about the Lean Mass Hyperspondor paper that we just got to release uh, this week. Uh, anything in this video is not medical advice, or really anything on YouTube is medical advice. So uh, bear that in mind. Um, on top of that, while we're going to be expressing our excitement with this paper, it's worth reemphasizing that the Lean Mass Hyperspondor phenotype, while it's being explored, um, it's not been verified for the level of risk that it is, and, and certainly conventional medicine and um, basically every major organization that looks to LDL cholesterol and ApoB as uh, it associates with cardiovascular disease uh, certainly considers it to be a substantial risk factor. So we really wanted to be sure to impress that. Um, we have good friends with Michael Midriff and uh, Ethan Weiss who would definitely like for us to impress upon that. So I really wanted to be sure that we put that forward. Um, and this is, by the way, why we're doing, as many of uh, the viewers know, we're doing the um, the study that's out of Lundquist. It's uh, with 100 lean mass hyperresponders, and it's actually currently underway. So if you haven't had a chance yet, you may want to check out citizensciencefoundation.org slash study, and you can learn a bit more about it. So all of that out of the way, how are you feeling about the launch of the paper, Nick? Well, um, like I said just a moment ago on Clubhouse, I have no idea really how it's going. I've only peered at uh, social media. It's been a, a, a busy past 24 hours with just some um, school stuff. We had an exam this morning and some other things were going on. So uh, have that behind me and now ready to uh, delve into it with you on lives, on podcasts. I'm really excited to get engaged. But you know, from, from what I'm hearing and from the few conversations I had with people this afternoon, it's getting overall very um, uh, positive responses. Of course, it's a very controversial paper. It's going to be people yeah. saying lots of things, but um, I think it's going quite well. Honestly, we've gotten a lot of great feedback. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I mean, I shouldn't, I should say this, and I'm sure you would agree there, as is common with papers, paper came forward there were additional double checks, including some people in the public who were able to find uh, some tweaks here and there that we were able to make. One call out I want to give is to Michael Midram, who I think uh, had a great uh, suggestion for a single word insertion that I think helped uh, the context of where we were wanting to go with, was it the conclusion or was it the... It was uh, the conclusion portion of the abstract. Um, right. We had used the word cardiometabolic risk. Um, which definitionally refers to the triglyceride and HCL components of metabolic syndrome. So we had used it accurately, but he thought it would provide further clarification to use the word otherwise low cardiometabolic risk other than just low card cardiometabolic risk in order to emphasize the fact that, you know, having high LDL is still considered a substantial risk factor. So right. that's, you know, helpful feedback. And he was very dispassionate and polite about it, which made us want to be more receptive to him just that's because how human discourse works. So if people want to get feedback, we're very open to hear it, but we might be more receptive to comments given with softer voices. Yes, well, definitely productive conversation is something I've always been a big fan of, as everyone knows. Uh, but in particular, I'm, I'm excited because this being the first paper that I've been on, definitely not your first rodeo. Um, I was excited that we were able to put out the data and the methodology. Um, right away. So there, uh, no, no doubt people will find um, things that they could bring to our attention uh, that I, I couldn't welcome more. I, I would like to know any and every possible uh, correction that would be meaningful and again, productive towards what the paper is. But the major, the major portions of it, particularly in its correlations and how tight these correlations are with things that we've kind of observed in the community for some time, I'm excited to say have been surprisingly strong, like much stronger than I thought that they were going to be. So mm -hmm. let's kind of unpack it a little bit. If anybody hasn't read the study yet, recognize that there's kind of two major data sets per se. Um, one is the standing survey that I've had for some time, and that does come with all the limitations that, that should be 
accounted for with the survey. You know, there's selection bias, it cannot be generalizable, et cetera. But then there's also a much tighter uh, case report, which uh, was actually Dr. Tro's um, case series with patients he's had. And in the, in the, um, the survey data, we were able to look at different correlations with those people who had gone on a low carb diet. And then we isolated out what it was that they had in common. And particularly we're interested in their lipid values, what their lipid values were before and what they are now. And especially after we stratified for the lower carbohydrate levels. And in the case series, basically there were five patients for which they had extraordinarily high levels of LDL. And Dr. Tro uh, utilized the introduction, or in, for many of these, of course, reintroduction of carbs, but only to a moderate amount to bring them from a ketogenic level to basically a low carb level. And that's that's my setup. I'm going to hand it off to you for what the results were. Well, I, I do want to circle back and talk about the methodology and the limitations because I think there are some uh, nuances there that I want to explore, um, especially with respect to the the survey data and the saturated fat issue, but. Yeah, I mean, the results were really, I mean, uh, <laughs> I was surprised by, by, by their um, degree of significance and really the tightness of the confidence intervals and the, um, you know, the main findings were, I mean, this is the real punchline. There is an inverse correlation, an inverse association between BMI an LDL cholesterol change on a low carb diet. So you can see Dave's holding up his iPad. Yeah. So that's the one is axis it? of this beautiful 3d bar graph. So if you're looking at the, um, here, this the, is the um, Y axis and the, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say, this is actually of the four up from the, uh, the abstract oh, okay. just to keep it a little bit easier, but basically right. I did want everyone to see, yes, as BMI goes down and as triglyceride and HDL go down, we see this on, on both these axes, which is why it's useful to have it in this 3D bar graph. Yeah. So you can actually see it because so guess what this axis is? That's the change, yeah. change yeah. in LDL cholesterol from going from whatever the prior, prior diet was into the low carb diet. Yeah, so really we, we had two major findings with respect to the, the um, uh, linear regression models, which were that BMI was inversely associated with LDL change and that triglyceride to HDL ratio, including on a low carb diet and prior to a low carb diet um, was inversely associated with LDL change. So, I mean, the conclusion is people who are leaner and with better, better, better metabolic health markers, sorry, it's been a long day, are the ones with the bigger increases in LDL, which is consistent with the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, but had never been previously demonstrated. So that was, you know, part one of the study, which is really exciting. And then to follow up on that, because like I said, you know, these data, are, which were discovered in a hypothesis naive manner, we took the data we had and we basically asked the computer to say, computer, like, tell us what are the strongest predictors of large LDL changes? And they were BMI and triglyceride to HDL ratio. But given that, we then thought it made sense to take the A priority um, definition of lean mass hyperresponder that you put forward in 2017 which was, um, or is LDLC above 200 HDLC above 80 and triglycerides below 70 and see, you know, first of all, like, is this actually a population that appears in our, um, cohort, uh, 597 people who are eligible, um, because it's never really been studied before. So, you know, these are three hard markers to hit individually. So their union, if they weren't really part of a broader pattern will be really unlikely. So we wanted to see if people, you know, like this actually existed um, and how they were different from anybody else. Now, what we found was, yeah, they definitely existed. I think 19% or 112 people were bona fide lean mass hyperresponders, fitting all three criteria. And then um, we found that they were actually leaner. And that might seem like a circular statement because they're lean mass hyperresponders, but it's important to emphasize the definition that you put forward is only based on the metabolic markers. The term lean um, is basically like, it, it's empiric, it's, in a, it's, a, it's almost a prediction, it's the hypothesis in and of itself, saying if we take people with these markers, because we're kind of seeing maybe leaner people have bigger jumps in LDL, but also bigger jumps in HDL, which we also showed in the paper that there was an inverse correlation between BMI and HDLC change 
which we can go into with respect to the lipid energy model. Um, anyway, we did find that these people were indeed leaner. I think the p-value was like 1.04 times 10 to the negative, like 11 yeah. for between <laughs> group differences. Which for um, a survey data is is crazy, right? Like this, that's so unlikely. Um, yeah, yeah, you know what though? So, I, I do want to add one piece to that, which is in exactly what you're talking about. A lot of times when I would say lean mass hyperspondor, even people who saw those three cut points, they would assume there was additional criteria associated with being lean as part of the criteria. But in this way, it's actually a lot like metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is technically descriptive of these five criteria that we know pretty well, particularly in medicine, which is, you know, waist to hip ratio, higher glucose, hypertension, and low HDL and high triglycerides. Well, those five are aspects of metabolism, but, but the name metabolic syndrome is kind of descriptive of where these things kind of come up in the same sense. That's where lean mass hyperspondor came from. But as I've confided to you and really in public many times over, had I probably had more time and realized just how big a deal this profile would be I probably would have spent a little more time trying to think of another name for it, because it's true. It is commonly thought that being lean is part of the criteria for being a lean mass hyperspondor, but it's really just the observation I kept seeing at the time and yeah. still do. I think somebody asked you the question on Twitter. I forget who it was. I don't even know if I know who it was, but like, would you be a lean mass hyperresponder if you're eating a high carb, like Cheeto and McDonald's diet and you meet these three cup points? And I think the answer will be yes, but like find me that person. I think it'd be very <laughs> hard to meet the, like, that's the thing. It would be hard to meet those three cup points if you weren't fulfilling, you know, if you weren't low carb and this pattern was happening to you. I mean, you could say that the, the lean mass hyperresponder triad is an exaggerated low carb triad where you do see low triglycerides, sometimes increases in HDL and increases in LDL. And, and now we know in particularly lean people, um, which was a major finding of the study. Um, and then I'll pass it back to you to say, you know, what the, the, the last bit was with respect to the case series data. Yes. So of course, um, this is actually something that we have shared many times over with uh, data, you know, shared by the groups, by people in comments and so forth. But I am a little proud to say that I actually did also in 2017. I'm not even sure if I shared this story with you before, but this was actually in advance of a lecture I was doing in the low carb cruise, I was playing with just how much to add in carbohydrates before I would see a pronounced drop in my LDL. And I found for myself, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of around 95. And at that time I didn't have a cardio check. So I was actually doing full blown lab corp, um, tests. So it was, it was getting pretty expensive, <laughs> but it was working. And that was the point at which I thought, you know, I really do think that there's something to glycogen stores in particular, not just bringing in, and sorry, I'm gonna get a little geeky here, but I know this is old hat to you at this point, but that there might be more than just the cascade that comes in with the endocrine system, with uh, insulin, glucagon, so forth, but that perhaps because it would stick per se, where like you could introduce carbs, you could swap them in and then actually take them back out and go keto for a while, the LDL would remain low for a while, I kept wondering if there might be something to say, repleting your glycogen stores, especially in the liver. And that's still with me today. I actually think that there really is something to that. And we'll be exploring that with the uh, lipid energy model, not to get yeah. too far ahead of us. I but. mean, your, your white bread experiment, I, I know it's not peer review, but I still think is one of the greatest staples of this field right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's such a beautiful demonstration. When you drop your LDL from like 283 to like 80 something in a week. That's how dynamic it is because you're just, you know, changing your um, metabolism to be carb dependent. Um, and the case series data were, you know, consistent with that. I mean, we had the one guy drop his LDL from 665 to 185, a drop of 480 with, he basically was introducing a sweet potato per day. That sweet right. potato was having like what, 10 times the magnitude of effect of, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges, but a statin. Um, obviously most people that go on lipid lowering meds don't have, can't even lower that low, you know, than yeah. I 665, but even so like the fact that you can use lifestyle change to drop an LDL by 480, irrespective of your perspective on the role of LDL and atherosclerosis, that is a scientifically astounding finding and just kind of cool. 
Now, to be sure, I, I'm confident that if you're a um, if you're a detractor, you're probably coming at it by saying, "Look, it should have never been that high in the first place." And there there absolutely could be a point to that, right? To where effectively, if it's getting that high, it's already very dangerous. You should already be taking steps to lower it. But here's, I think, a key point. If there's any key takeaway that I think this research is helping to illuminate, it's that. Certainly there are many different levers, if you will, that can impact our lipid levels. And it's something I'm quite obsessed with. As you know, I'm about to do a fiber experiment uh, that's gonna be, I think, pretty exciting. I, I'm looking forward to it, maybe. We'll see how, we'll see how it goes. But, uh, but, the, um, but the lever of metabolic pathway for me is without question, if you're already metabolically flexible is an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily big influencer. It can really change your lipid profile. And even though I brought mine to 83, I think I could have gone lower if I'd had the stomach for it. The problem was, is that on that diet where I was over consuming white bread and processed meat, I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor at the time. And so I saw my, my glucose levels just I sky high yeah. it was like the Alps for long times. And I didn't want to be that hyperinsulinemic for that long. So Fair I eventually enough. had to cut loose of that. Yeah, I haven't done the experiment because my gut but just couldn't handle the carb load. As you know, uh, ketogenic diet has been therapeutic for my uh, colitis. But I actually want to disagree with you on a point that you just made, if I may. And yeah. that was people would say it never should have been that high in the first place. I mean, that's kind of the contribution of this study. If you if you want to, you know, take that perspective is that, you know, people don't really know what the major sources of um, heterogeneity in terms of individuals responses to low carb diets are why do only a minority of people have increases in LDL? And what this paper is showing is that, you know, one of the predictors might be leanness. And this guy was the leanest guy in the case series there, you know, consistent with he had the largest spike. So prior to this data coming out to which this individual contributed, how would he have known that he would have been a hyper responder? And then when he did have the response, what'd they do? They reversed the phenotype and brought them actually below 190 from 65 to below 190 with lifestyle intervention. So, you know, it never should have been that high in the first place. How is he to know? And then they should be takes to be doing, you know, taking steps to bring it down, which they did. Right. Which, which brings us back to the metabolism aspect, right? So it's at least us knowing, how, at least us knowing there's a whole other category that's not maybe as considered as it should be that it could be metabolic as to how much you're fueled by fat or carbs in this context. That at least opens up a new door for consideration. And certainly I hope that if that is the reason for the higher or lower levels of LDL, it's not assumed to be genetic in nature. And hopefully this research can illuminate that when in fact it is not due to genetics uh, in that respect. We do yeah. actually have some questions from the chat, which I'm gonna jump okay. to real quick. All right. Um, so first of all, what about, so this actually comes from, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read all the names. I'll just say what the questions are. Did the, the LMHR group present genetic similarities? So that, that was a limitation of our survey and on the, on the survey side, fortunately on the case series side, we did actually have, uh, genetics that were examined. And they were all, yeah, all null findings. Every, every LMHR that I know that has been examined for, you know, polymorphisms associated with familial hypercholesterolemia is nothing's been found. Now that doesn't mean everybody's genome has been carefully combed for, you know, mutations that could have a pleomorphic effect on both BMI and, um, uh, response, which is a possibility. Um, that's, you know, that said, the lipid energy model, which we can talk about, actually does provide a framework for testing hypotheses like that. Um, so, you know, my prediction um, would be that it's not associated with genetics and that you could take a single individual and manipulate their BMI over time and LDL will go up or down, which actually you and I have both done. Right. You know, when my weight comes up, my BMI goes down. I mean, when my BMI goes up, my LDL goes down. And I think the same happens with you. Um, I literally I, I, gained, I literally gained 20 pounds in 2018 to help capture a lot of this data. And indeed it went as low as where it was before I started ketogenic diet. It was at uh, 130, which again, yeah. detractors might say is not actually that low, but it's, it's half of what it was roughly while I was on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. I mean, when you, you invoke these other explanations, given the data, um, you know, what they say, you need to basically be saying, 
that the genetics affect these two outcomes, the LDLC change and the BMI. And it's the same thing with, you know, um, like the saturated fat, you need the leaner people to be selectively and leaner and the metabolically healthier people to be selectively eating the saturated fat. Is it possible? Is it possible that there's genetics that contribute to both things? It's not something we can exclude as a possibility. I just wouldn't put it forth as the most likely possibility. Um, and for what it's worth, you know, I, I've been combing over my own genome. I actually have a whole exome sequence so I can go back to my VCF file and check it for single nucleotide polymorphisms anytime something comes up in the literature. Um, and I've been yet to find anything that explains my phenotype, um, like the lipid energy model and like, you know, that simple relationship triglyceride to HDL ratio, BMI and LDLC change. So I got another question for us. What about people who don't think they identify as lean mass hyperresponder by BMI, but have the same experience with diet change to carbohydrate restricted diet or ketogenic diet? Um, well, BMI isn't part of the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. If someone has, I mean, the limitation of this study is that, or one of the limitations, we're not doing body composition data. Exactly. We weren't able to do that. We just had BMI. So if you're Dwayne the Rock Johnson with a BMI of 34.3 and you're technically obese, you know, could he be LMHR? Yeah but he has very little body fat relative to lean mass. So it's lean mass hyperresponder. So if we were to redo the study in a perfect world, there's a lot of things we do differently. I probably get, you know, DEXA comps on everybody. Yeah. Um, as I would predict, that would be a stronger predictor. Absolutely. Um, so that would be my response to that. So next we've got long-term risk of major cardiovascular event by APOB, APOA1 and the APOB slash APOA1 ratio. What do you think of this ratio in the lean mass hyperresponders? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty careful not to comment on risk. What I'm going to say is this study doesn't assess risk. It's going to be assessed by the LMHR trial. Um, and I don't think my personal hypotheses will be productive at this point. Feel free to weigh in, Dave. Yeah, well, and even then, I'll further qualify that I think the, uh, the clinical um, the clinical trial you're talking about that we're doing out of Lundquist will provide additional data, but will not be determined by. So we're, we're definitely making lots of effort. Um, if it looks that way, it's because that's exactly what it is. We want to be very proactive to try to bring everyone together to try to get this data, you know, whether you're, whether you're a proponent or a skeptic alike, uh, let's all agree to just find out, let's, you know, get under the hood and to that, to the degree that we may have our own hypotheses, our own interests and, and what we think, uh, maybe the case, um, you know, the good news is the data is on the way it's, it's for us, it's kind of like a pencils down moment. I mean, that's kind of how I think of it. Yeah. Uh, one thing else I'll say on this topic is that, you know, uh, ratios can be helpful. Um, you know, markers can be helpful, but at the end of the day, the study that you're basing it on is going to have, you know, error. And people in that study who are going to respond differently and they're reporting, you know, means or medians, um, which may be significant, but that still doesn't tell you what's going to happen in any given individual patient. Um, and I think that's important to emphasize because people like to say anecdotes don't matter. I think anecdotes are the most important thing because only your anecdote matters. So there's always the option if you're concerned to advocate with, you know, your physician to get functional scanning. Um, like I know we both um, either had or have planned um, CCTAs, um, not CACs, not CIMPs, but real CCTAs to look at soft uh, and hard plaque accumulation to say, you know, in my body, what's going on? And that allows people to make more informed choices. Now that's a conversation you really have to have with your physician because of the radiation exposure and all that. But I just want to point out that, you know, when push comes to shove, there are functional tests that can be done to assess what's going on in you. Absolutely. Next question is, can you comment on what you would expect with a lean mass hyperresponder LP little a value to be, uh, provide some reference intervals. Uh, let me actually first put in a plug real quick for my good friend and colleague, Siobhan Huggins, who has actually done quite a lot of research on this because she has uh, higher LP little a which we suspect to be um, genetically uh, resulting from genetics. And to what degree that there is or isn't risk, she actually has a, an entire presentation she did that's at cholesterolcode.com slash LPA. 
Yeah. And I, I highly recommend it again, not medical advice and so forth, but I will say this anecdotally because we don't have this in this study. I actually, Dr. Tro may have done that with the case series. Do you do it? I can you? reveal my data. I just think it might be a little like my metallic because I've been public about it before and even, you know, put it out there on the internet. Um, I have genetically high LPAA2, I think even higher than Siobhan's or around. It runs between 120 and 190. Um, my dad does too. It's genetically inherited um, for me. And it was that high when my LDL was in the 90s prior to, to, to uh, keto and my response. And even when my LDL has hit its peak, it really like the LP little A has been pretty static. It's been between like 120 and 190, just variably. Whereas, you know, very consistently, my LDL is high, much higher, it increased fivefold and more when I went low carb. So, you know, I think a lot of it is just genetically determined baseline. I do think it can be elevated by inflammation further, but I do think yes, people it just is, have to have a baseline. It, LP little a is definitely an acute phase reactant and an acute phase reactant is a protein. Basically they classify that as any protein that increases 25% or more in an immune response. And so I'm not going to do it justice, but this is, I'm sure what Siobhan would say in brief, but the Dave version, which is that, um, both her and I certainly are very interested in ApoB containing lipoproteins and LP little a, which technically is also ApoB, but with a crinkle tail, uh, they, they tend to seem, they seem to be impacted predominantly by three general categories. Genetics is one. Uh, when they're in acute phase reactant and both can be qualified as an acute phase reactant given circumstances that bring up both in an inflammatory response. But the third, which we wish there was more studying on, which we're hoping to change is metabolic. Siobhan has shown by doing the Feldman protocol that she's been able to change her LP little a in concert uh, with her LDL particle count. Um, but even closer to her LDL cholesterol, which she also goes into in the, uh, the LPA the LP little a uh, discussion. However, she has something even better in that she also had gotten sick a few times and happened, bless her heart, to have also gotten some uh, data on it as well. And because she has such a large succession of different tests, it did show that there was typically a bit of a, a rise relative to, and alongside other acute phase reactants like C-reactive protein around that same time that she was sick. It's really amazing data. Um, so again, all anecdotal, and not medical advice, et cetera, but that I think is a good place to check in, at least with what we have thus far, um, with all of those limitations being well known. Uh, so we have, do we know if women at various life cycles should be viewed as specific phenotypes? That seems kind of a little bit more like a general question for a good Harvard med student. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat the question. Uh, do you, do we know if women at various life cycles should be viewed as specific phenotypes? I know what I would guess. I mean, what do you mean specific phenotypes? I mean, like, I, I think uh, it's possible. I think it's possible what they did mean in the context of maybe this triad or lean mass hyper responders. Um, I think that harkens back to, I don't know if we were, if this was on clubhouse or a question, um, that was asked earlier here, but, um, somebody asked about, um, uh, geographic ancestry or ethnicity, I think they actually use the phrase and, um, you know, what modifying effects it has. And if I may actually draw a parallel to BMI with, with that example, it's, you know, like, um, people who are African American, they have different BMI cutoffs and it might be in future that we want different, uh, LMHR cutoffs for people who are African American or maybe women, or maybe postmenopausal women. Right now, we don't know. So the earlier you start, you know, down a line of investigation, the more, um, you know, rough data you're going to have. So we're using the a priori cutoff points that they put forward in 2017 just to kind of validate the existence of this phenotype and classify it as a starting point. Um, but it, it doesn't mean it's end of the, it, it doesn't mean it's end of the definition. And so I think, yeah, fact, I, I would, I, I'll, I'll bet you would agree with me that it's probably <laughs> it's probably going to get modified. We probably will have subclassifications. We, we already see this um, with different ethnicities that, that you, you've just, you've got literally different genetic templates to a degree for which, you know, medical concerns and, and anatomy and all sorts of things are, should be considered. Let, let me twist this because now I'm really starting to like this question, even though I still don't really understand it. 
when, I'm not even going to say if, when we get to the point um, where we have different cutoff points and different subclasses of LMHR, I will be very happy because that means the research will have progressed to that point. And I agree, by the way, I don't, I'm not attached to the cut points that I guessed. It's, I feel like it was hoping to crack open the door and I feel great enough about that to have wonderful people like yourself on board to, yeah. uh, you know, move this into the next, the next I, phase. I, I will say that LDL levels and other um, markers do tend to change um, as women go through menopause. Um, how that interacts with the LMHR phenotype, I don't think is clear. Right. Especially if women are or aren't on um, hormone replacement therapy, I can change it as well. Can you provide context if one is an LMHR and has a positive calcium score? So short answer is no. Um, we, I mean, that's definitely something you want to work with your doctor on. Um, we're, it's, we're such in a preliminary state right now. And I think that uh, even the anecdotal data we have is just, it's very inadequate, especially with calcification. Uh, the CACs, even, even longitudinal CACs anecdotally are extremely few and far between, e not even just in lean mass hyperspondor uh, communities, but just in general, uh, particularly if it's likely a lower risk population. Um, and, and this isn't to say lean mass hyperspondors are a likely a lower risk population. It's just that oftentimes I think that they're presumed to be when they may not be necessarily, which is something I give. Uh, Philippa credit to uh, drawing out and, you know, putting attention toward. So uh, unfortunately, at least my answer is we just, w w I mean, there's really not a lot that's known right now. Did yeah. you want to add anything to that? I guess I'd just say, you know, obviously I, I, I don't have any further insight beyond this than you, but if it were me, I, I personally would feel less comfortable knowing that I had pre-existing damage than were I to have no pre-existing damage. I think one possibility um, is that we could find that there's a um, bimodal response in the, um, the lean mass hyper-responder study, whereby actually, surprisingly, you know, there are people who don't have much progression despite their high LDL. And there are people that have high progression, um, even though they're LMHR, and maybe a differentiating, differentiating factor could be level of baseline damage to the endothelium, um, which could correlate maybe with a, a CAC score. So I, I, I genuinely do not know, but if it were me making a decision for myself with my doctor, um, if I had pre-existing findings, I'd be a little bit more conservative if for no other reason than you don't have as much of a buffer if that's fair to say. Yeah, I think you've already side. commented on that, right? Where you would, I mean, is, is <clears throat> you personally, you're, you've shared your personal threshold with what you've learned thus far and at least where your, your leanings are. And it, it is different for you depending on how much you, ha you would have existing disease, right? Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into every individual, you know, in the, every individual patient's decision. And so I don't think it's for one person to tell another person what to do. And that's a discussion you have to have with your doctor, but um, yeah, I, I, I've gone over and over in this with my physicians and made, you know, my personal choices that if my circumstances were different, um, including having, you know, higher baseline risk, I might've made different choices. I, in fact, I would have made different choices. Um, so there's a lot to every individual equation. And I think it's your right to make the decision that you think is correct for you. And hopefully we'll have more data to inform that decision in future. That's the whole point of the LMHR study. Right. So, uh, Ravi, by the way, hi, Ravi. Um, he says, but low triglycerides and high HDL should reduce ApoB, ApoA1 ratio. Am I correct? And actually I have an answer to that, which is in, in the circumstance of lean mass hyperspondors, that is not what we see. That is what, that is what was presumed from the Framingham data, because that typically was the case that typically speaking, uh, the more, so atherogenic dyslipidemia is high triglyceride, low HDL, and then going in the other direction, a kind of reverse atherogenic dyslipidemia is, is the opposite. And usually, yes, it would be higher relative LDL on the atherogenic dyslipidemic side and lower relative LDL on the reverse atherogenic dyslipidemic side until this population started to emerge for which that really created this new level of discordance that we don't normally see. And so, no, in fact, there's a, there's generally speaking a higher ApoB 
two APOA ratio, it's it's not that dramatic depending on how far, I guess you could say, um, uh, to one end of the spectrum, the lean mass hyperspondyl phenotype cut points are. But that generally speaking, that uh, it does end up, there does end up being a very high level of both APOB and APOA1, but that APOB doesn't necessarily uh, change in that ratio as it changes, uh, as would be typical with Framingham's data. Yeah. And what I'd just like to say now is that the whole point of this paper and the papers to come probably is going to be that LMHR break a lot of expectations and break a lot of rules. Right. Enough said. I, well, I just look, think that's why it's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, we, we just, there's not a lot of data that is gathered and analyzed around populations that don't already have more than one um, cardiometabolic risk factor alongside high LDL. It's certainly something I've advocated for a long time, as everyone knows, is that we try to intentionally isolate, try to look to uh, those populations who otherwise appear healthy, especially metabolically, uh, but ideally across multiple metrics for which they would look as ideal as possible alongside having high LDL, which is why I've you know, pressed for getting the triad data, even though the triad data may not just apply to low carbers, we know that there has been triad data. I know that there's uh, data in NHANES, and as you guys may already know, there's a couple of um, teams that I'll be um, actually farming this question out to and we'll be looking at their respective data sets to look at what the triad looks like. The triad being, of course, high LDL, high HDL, low triglycerides. But that is unusual, at least, because usually atherogenic dyslipidemia goes with slightly higher um, LDL and, of course, a much higher preponderance of small dense LDL particles. Uh, we have another one that says my numbers follow the same profile, but do not meet your high cutoff criteria. Is there a subclass, e.g., LM, LMR? <laughs> so, real quick, um, again, that it's not a it's not a goal, right? It's, wanna, it's a, yeah. It's, Bring it's up an three observed... bar graph again. It's it's just it's great. It's th there's no magic number, right? It the, it's the triad that. I threw some cut points on based on pattern recognition. Um, for example, the study that we're doing out of Lundquist isn't quote unquote true LMHR cut points because they're a little more relaxed. Instead of an LDL of 200, it's an LDL of 190 and above. Instead of an LDL, instead of an HDL of 80, it's an HDL of 60 and above. And instead of triglycerides of 70 or below, it's actually triglycerides of 80 or below. Basically that triad, the high LDL, high HDL, low triglyceride triad is kind of already in the direction of uh, the LMHR phenotype. But again, and with emphasis, it's not necessarily a goal. It's really just a, a pattern of interest that we want to get further study on. Right. None of, none of these, I mean, no mark, no cutoff in general. When you generate a cutoff, you're trying to differentiate two populations that are going to overlap and no cutoff is a magic number. BMI of 25, there's no real difference between somebody with a BMI of 24.9 and 25.1, all things being equal. Somebody with an HPA of 1C of you know 6.4 versus 6.6. .6. These are all at some level arbitrary numbers that you just have to you know put down to make a definition. So if your levels are you know 199 HDL, uh, 79, sorry, 199 LDL, 79 HDL, and like 71 triglyceride, you know, like it, it, basically LMHR. Look, it's the same, it's the same with metabolic syndrome. If my dad's, yeah. uh, uh, blood pressure was just right under reference range and his waist to hip ratio was just under reference range. If you <laughs> suck in and just after you go to the bathroom, right. I, I wouldn't, I no like, longer have metabolic syndrome. I wouldn't be like, Whew. All right. Just make sure you keep your blood at exactly 99 and make sure your waist like, no, of course not. That's, you know, it's, it's not a snap point. It's, it's a direction. And we're interested in what the direction is telling us uh, with regard to what the data is. Um, oh, uh, just wanted to add one more thing. So Philly, who was talking above um, on, I, I think Philly, you were the one we were talking about the CAC. Thank you. I've decided to take a low dose of statin. Um, again, can't emphasize enough, please work with your doctor, uh, determine what, what course of care is right for you and your doctor, talk with your family, uh, try to learn as much as you can about the disease for yourself and for the decisions you make. I, I could not encourage that more. Yeah. And I just want to say Philly and for people on YouTube on the record, look, look, people know, I think a lot of people know my decision 
was not to take a statin given my conversation with my doctor, but I just want to say right here, right now, I 100% support your decision because it was your conversation with your doctor and it was an estimate, you know, the determination you made and that's your prerogative as a patient. And um, so good for you and thank you for sharing. Well, and I do want to mention one thing just on a personal note um, that I talked about briefly with Ethan Weiss in a recent conversation we had on Chatty's podcast. Um, I, there, there is, and I do want to mention this and emphasize it. There's never been a single point in time where I've been completely comfortable with high LDL, even in my most optimistic moments. Uh, as I said, then, if you were to put on 10 scale with, you know, zero being, I completely don't know versus 10 being, I'm completely certain everything is fine. I'm nowhere close to a 10, even if I have any kind of cautious optimism. And in that respect, Um, I myself have done a number of advanced tests. I continue doing tests, not just my blood work, but also um, I've had three CACs and I've had uh, CTAs, including one of the CTAs that's out of the Lundquist Institute. And so I'm, I take this, not just this research seriously, but I take my own safety seriously. So it's, it's certainly something that I think, you know, again, we're all on our own personal health journey. And it is something that you want to be sure that you know where your comfort levels are and that you feel confident in what you're able to work out with your doctor and your family and as much as you've been able to learn about it. All right. I have, looks like two from Zachary. Just real quick. Say the results from the study come back negative. What comes next? Do you have any alternative theories on why people would fall into this response? Come back negative as in people don't have progression. Yeah. I was, I was wondering about that too, because of course, yeah, neg- I- that can be interpreted one of two ways, right? So usually when you say negative, like the t- test was negative for cancer, uh, something like that, you're a lot of times it's, it's spoken of as though there wasn't a signal. I think, I think where you were saying is if it comes back negative, as in it turns out lean mass hyperspotters are showing a rapid progression of atherosclerosis. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, I, as I've said many times publicly before, we would want to get that information out as fast as possible. I mean, really, we want to do it no matter what we want to get, we want everyone to be as informed as they can on what the data is, as it happens. But I do think that that would be very relevant. Um, because I think that a lot of lean mass hyperspotters, especially at the highest of LDL would be strongly considering taking steps to lower it. Um, so I, I think, I think, you know, that probably diverges from what we would expect, but the whole point of asking this question is because we don't know what the answer is. That's the point of science. And because it's such, such a charged space, there's probably going to be a lot of, I told you so as if that does happen, but guess what? I've been perfectly comfortable with that. I've been perfectly comfortable because I feel right now, this is a provocative question to ask where the answer could go a couple of ways. And I just want to know what the truth is because that's, part of the scientific method. And quite honestly, being personally an LMHR myself, that would be useful data for me to make life decisions. And I would start, probably start lipid lowering therapies. Um, right. Since right now, carbohydrate reintroduction doesn't really seem to be an option for me. So, yes. you know, we just want an answer. Uh, I, I don't know if that will be the outcome, but uh, that's what science is. So actually he, he does in his second question, hit the other side. So indeed, alternatively, if the results come back that these participants have no plaque buildup. What's the next goal study? Question mark. How do you think this information could be used practically in medical practice? So first things first, um, it's not an either or. It's quite possible that there's something in between or that there's, for, for example, let me, give it, let me give an example. Let's say that um, there wasn't a strong signal in the general populace of the lean mass hyperspotters, but there was say a handful that saw a a rapid progression. So that would be surprising because in, in the scatter plot, right, you'd see like just this, these, these on one end pop, and it could be that there's a genetic connection, in which case we're happy that we're doing lots of uh, wide spectrum genetic testing. It could be that there's uh, some association with the over-exercising. We know that that can be potentially risk into the general population. It might be the case with lean mass hyperspotters. Regardless, that would be something we'd want to look into, right? Um, but that's a possibility if it's, let's say, you know, 10% higher than what we would expect for likewise cohorts, given better data that we can use for comparison, that would be very relevant, right? But then at that point, people who are facing 
decisions as to how high their risk is given the medical conditions that they're considering. Like let's say that they're a severe epileptic and they, they find it's really difficult for them to tolerate any carbs and they're having a difficult time with many of the medicines. At least they have some sense of something with regard to risk um, on something that they can you know, look at for comparison. Um, but yeah, if let's say that there, let's say it looked really good. Let's say that there was no um, substantial progression. Naturally, there would be many who would say, look, we need even more longer term data um, that we you know, may wanna focus in on some people in this study, some people are not. Um, maybe it would open up the possibility of something closer to an RCT. I, I'm doubtful uh, that we could RCT people to a ketogenic diet for which they would become you know, very high level LMHR, but I guess it depends on, on what that data showed. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of un, there's a lot of open questions as to what it would turn out to be. Yeah, I think besides the obvious conclusions that people would draw, um, I think the most beneficial thing to a finding, a, a negative finding in this case, would be just an amplified version of the effect this LMHR paper is having, which is getting more minds interested in this phenotype. Uh, I don't mean to put words in your, your mouth, Dave, but my understanding is the only reason you're dedicating a large portion of your life to this now is because you observe something that you thought was interesting. And to your surprise, it seems like a blind spot of both lipidologists and cardiologists, and nobody seems to get interested in it. And so you felt compelled to get interested in it. And I actually am in the same boat now where I'm like, there are a lot of really interesting things going on right now. And actually we know how to study them. We're like, it's pretty easy to do you know, do a tracer study if you have the resources. I don't, you don't. But the goal of this is to get more minds involved so we can study this phenotype. So if we had results showing, oh, actually, there's no progression, that would provoke a ton of interest and inspire a bunch of studies on the mechanisms behind LMHR, helping us to better understand, you know, why this phenotype exists and also why people are at reduced risks, which could have massive implications, not just for LMHR, but beyond. And really Absolutely. revolutionize like how we understand, you know, atherosclerosis, cardio, ASCPD. Yeah, but no, exactly what you're saying. Look, a lot of this is just trying to get the ball in motion, not just with us. Like I, it's, I think a lot of times in science, it's very exhilarating to feel you're the one bringing the, you know, the new discovery to light. And there's almost a kind of miserliness sometimes. And, and wanting to reveal the discovery, but not reveal too much, almost like it's an invention. People don't want um, to be swooped. Yeah, but, Swoop but this us. is something, yeah, exactly. This is something, Nick, you and I share. We, we're constantly putting out, you know, where we stand almost as if our, our whole life and our social media is just a big workbook, right? And to the degree that people may be um, getting inspired and may come up with things that we haven't thought of. I mean, carpe diem, please, you know, bring as much, bring as much new knowledge to this as we can get, because we definitely feel at a minimum, it's something that's just not getting the level of attention it deserves, especially now, especially that we know that there's so many people who are benefiting specifically from ketogenic um, uh, therapies. I, I really wanna say this again, I know you know this, Nick, but just to repeat it one more time for the audience and everyone else, I know there's a lot of people who can thrive on a lot of different diets. And, and I don't think of myself as somebody who's going to say, oh, here's the one diet that's superior to all others. I, I just don't think that way. However, there is a small fraction of people for which it seems specifically a very carb-restricted diet is especially a value, like it saved their lives. It, became, it, it gave them their life back. And for those folks, those are the people who we most care about getting this data for. They should know. They should know. We owe them this the level of risk that they're really facing, or at least to start getting the ball rolling towards getting that data. Couldn't agree more. All right, we're gonna wrap here shortly, but I'm gonna look to see if there's any last questions. Uh, I think I'm gonna give it just another five, 10 minutes. Um, I'm in your hyper response group, six feet, 157. My cardio scan was virtually zero. Uh, LDL 300, HDL 86, watching your video with Dr. Barry. Now wondering if upping carbs would lower my LDL. Well, of course, our, our paper suggests that that's probably a likelihood. Um, but again, you know, with all of the caveats and limitations uh, that you can see in it. Yeah. 
if you wanted to add anything. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, do the experiment. It's not that hard. I mean, assuming that you don't need to be in ketosis for any reason. I mean, if you have a condition that requires it, that's another thing. But if you're just doing it for body composition or, you know, weight loss, add back yeah. a sweet potato a day for a week. See what happens. Uh, hurt you. Sarah B says, I react to most carbs. Yeah, I, there's a, there's a 63 year old epileptic female who I talked to two or three weeks ago, I want to say. And, um, <clears throat> she seemed to have almost a like peanut allergy to carbs. I never really heard of it at this level of sensitivity before, but she actually has to be mindful of where she eats, um, based on what they cook, you know, on the skillets or if they wash the pans enough or anything along those lines. And I, and I was, I was honestly a little skeptical at first. Cause I was like, it may be oils, you know, it might be like other oxidation or something along those lines, but what was her reaction? Um, she gets typical things you hear about with epileptics of a certain type where it's like halos, there's kind of halo effects first. And then there's actually, um, uh, potential periods for which there's uh, seizure activity and, and it can last for yeah. like two days for her. Um, I don't, I don't think want you to can have to a it. generalized carb allergy, but I think that, uh, I think that, you know, first of all, your microbiome can become adapted to be relatively intolerant to carbs. Um, also ketosis can be therapeutic for me. It is, I can tell you, it's kind of freaky. I was tracking my ketones at the beginning of doing my ketogenic diet. And, um, I got to a point where based on my, how my stomach was feeling, I could tell you within about 0.2 millimoles of accuracy where my ketones were running. Um, I just got a sixth sense for it because, you know, there was such a tight correlation between how I felt, how my gut felt and where my ketone levels were. And so I do think that, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate is a really powerful, not just fuel substrate, but, um, hormone like substrate signaling molecule. So in people who, you know, that's one of the major mediating factors, having carbs, keeping you out of ketosis could be, you know, contributing to the, the phenomenon. I don't that know this individual. That may be it. Uh, Sarah B, by the way, also added carbs, give me joint pain, bloating, et cetera. I probably have EDS and have a referral to a geneticist. Um, I have celiac too. have to avoid all grains, huh. uh, mast cell activation syndrome. Sarah, Elo, I do. Elo Standler's EDS. EDS. You know? Yeah. Um, so question. Best, best of luck, Sarah. That, that sounds pretty rough. Uh, but, it, but it's true. It's funny how many people I've talked to since this journey began, where they bounced around to lots of different diets. It just, it wasn't even on the table before keto kind of became big. And so even multiple removal diets often would have something like rice as the thing you removed everything down to. And so a lot of people <clears throat> even trying to do that version of a multiple removal diet would keep missing it. They'd keep saying, I still seem to have issues and they couldn't figure it out. And now I know a lot of people who do a multiple removal diet, but with like, say, you know, um, steak and eggs, for example, as the base, I think there's still allergies is, with eggs, but is, um, Sarah suggesting that her ketogenic diet's been therapeutic for her EDS, Elo Stanlos, is that what she's referring to Dan, whatever, because I haven't heard that before. It's a pretty rare genetic condition affecting connective tissue. So I just don't know people who have it, who have gone keto. I just interested to know if, if, if that's what she's saying. I yeah. Doubt it. Um, I, you know, she says, uh, E H L E R S D A N I L O S. Yeah. 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 I react to oh. airborne fumes from outside restaurants. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I, that's very interesting. You bring that up. I just tweeted two papers out and I've been talking about it with my, um, my HMS uh, metabolic health group about, um, I noticed this past Thanksgiving that um, I, I was having very like, strong reactions and feeling not so well after our eating days. Um, but I've been pretty conservative about what I ate. And there were certain foods around me that, you know, I just smelled and I, they smell very strong to me. And there were foods I ate prior to, um, you know, when I would, was having flares when I, uh, you know, had ulcerative colitis prior to keto, um, at least when it was manifesting. And I had this thought that it, you know, it, it's not, it's kind of sounds far-fetched that you don't even need to consume the food to have a metabolic reaction to it, that your body could, you know, preemptively have a hyper response. 
And so I looked up some of the literature and there actually is literature showing, at least in rodent models, like, you know, the sight of uh, food or the smell of food in rodents can change liver metabolism, like change mTOR expression in anticipation. But also that in, and this was in a colitis model, a rat model, um, that there were neurons in the brain, I think it was the insul insular cortex that became activated by eating certain foods. And then by just activating those neurons in the brain, they were able to induce top down colitis. Wow. Which wow. is kind of crazy. And huh. so I, I do think that they actually, you know, this is an area that needs to be, be explored more, but the fact that you say you can have a response to just like the smell of food or the sight of food, I, I'm thinking is less and less far-fetched. It makes sense. Our bodies can respond to external cues in preparation for um, nutrient intake. It, we're kind of primed to do that. It makes sense. Um, even to well document a phenomenon like the um, cephalic phase insulin response, where you just taste something sweet and you can have a response, um, anticipation of incoming glucose. So I'm, I'm thinking more and more, and even just observing in myself, probably should do some proper experiments where I like sniff pecan pie before bed. But, uh, you know, that, yeah, maybe there's something going on. And from the scientific aspect, this is so cool. From the patient aspect, it's like, oh, this sucks. Because now I'm like, what? Like I'm having like a, you know, a, a, a hosting a party. It's like, I'm just going to eat what I'm going to eat. But now you can't bring any of your food. Like, obviously you can't do that. So kind of yeah. puts you in a bind, a pickle, but maybe I'll just stuff some like lemons up my nose or something. But it, sorry, I went off on a, on a diatribe there that is totally unrelated to the LMHR paper, but I just found that a really interesting observation. No, but you know, this all can kind of tie up together and I can kind of thank Nathan Owens because he dropped in and also made a, a poignant comment, which is, you know, sometimes I forget exactly what he says, but sometimes it's just about feeling better. Like you just feel better on X diet, as opposed to, it's gotta be completely debilitating for you to not be on the standard American diet. Maybe you just feel really good on diet X, whatever diet X is right. Whatever that is. But then there's this one marker marker Y for which there's a high concern. Obviously it's all that much more reason for us to want to learn more about this relationship between the two. And that's, that's, what's exciting. I mean, look in my mind, this is the new, this is the new volume we've, we've crossed a, a dotted line. We're in the new, we're in the new space where the phase um, two LMHR phase two. phase two. Yes, exactly. The, <laughs> the, the phase two where, uh, you know, we're getting closer to tackling the, um, well, all, 99% all of, the, of people did not get that, but that's fine. Right. <laughs> All the analogies I'm, I'm thinking of are not appropriate. So I'll just leave those off the table. Anyway, thank you guys all for joining us. I think we're going to go and wrap it here. So it's a clean hour. Um, but uh, thanks again to those who weren't able to join us, which of course are our co-authors. Thanks to Adrian Sotomoda, right? That's how I say it. Yeah. Uh, David Ludwig. And of course, uh, Dr. Tro uh, for helping us put together this paper. And thank you all, all of you guys who are, downloading it and reading it. Remember, the more you tweet and share this, the more you're downloading and reading the paper, the more it helps us, the more it helps move this research forward, because that's, that's how they know, you know, that's how they know that, I mean, that's how more people out there uh, can uh, have a sense of how, how relevant this is. And obviously I'm a little biased, but I don't know about you, Nick, I think it's going to be pretty relevant. No doubt, no doubt in my mind. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. Uh, we're going to continue talking, so don't worry. This is be conversation one. I, I, we're going to be with you for years. Yeah. Like, don't worry. <laughs> You'll see a lot of us. We'll be it's embarrassed like later when we get to look back on this in the future. We'll use yeah, we just did a time capsule, a five-year time capsule the other day. What? We'll, we'll tell them five later. years. Like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> we're not going to see it for five years. All right, guys. Everyone have a wonderful weekend.